I am Sandy Albright, and I'm a perioperative registered nurse and senior nurse consultant at Cardinal Health. In the next few minutes, we're going to discuss why it has never been more important to choose the right surgical gown for each procedure. And we'll see how AMI standards were created to help OR directors, materials management, and clinical staff select the right gown every time. After this presentation, you should be better prepared to discuss the importance of managing infection risk in the OR and how your surgical gown selection can play a vital role. Describe the purpose of AMI and its gown standards. Outline the four levels of AMI barrier protection. Know the three questions you should ask yourself every time you select the gown for a given procedure. And review how clinicians and materials management should collaborate to improve gown purchases, enhance safety, and controlling costs at the same time. Let's get started by sharing why Cardinal Health is uniquely qualified to help you. With more than 40 years of experience, Cardinal Health is a recognized leader with a top ranking for transforming the healthcare supply chain to meet new challenges around costs, revenues, and outcomes. As a supplier and leading manufacturer of medical surgical products, we have had an unparalleled understanding of the healthcare value chain. In fact, we are an industry leading manufacturer of surgical drapes and gowns. So Cardinal Health is uniquely able to give you more of what you want most, a simple way to support your reputation of delivering quality care while lowering costs at the same time. Now let's turn our focus to surgical gowns, starting with a basic but critical question. What are the main purposes of surgical gowns? There are two. First, to protect patients from microorganisms carried by surgical team members or the patients themselves. And second, to protect healthcare providers from contact with infectious microorganisms that the patients may harbor. So why is it important to focus on the risk of infection? There are several reasons. The rise of new pathogens and antibiotic resistant bacteria, also known as superbugs, is kindling a new movement to improve patient and staff safety. In fact, healthcare associated infections are such a costly and lethal issue that the Affordable Care Act mandates constant improvement and cuts Medicare payments by 1% for hospitals that fall into the top 25% bracket for infection rates. So is it any wonder that the drive for safety in America's hospitals has never been greater? Today, safety is at the heart of quality initiatives aimed to improve the health of the patient, clinician, and hospital. These initiatives are designed to support quality outcomes, enhance patient and staff satisfaction, and protect reimbursements by helping to minimize never events and minimize the 30-day readmission penalties. On the other hand, understanding the risk of infection can have serious consequences. Next slide, please. Pathogens transmitted through blood, fluids, and skin cells can cause dangerous infections such as HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. Surgical site infections are the most common type of infection, costing as much as $35,000 per incident and $10 billion every year across our industry. To give providers a consistent method by which to measure surgical gown barrier properties, Amy established a classification standard. Next slide, please. AMI is the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. It is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1967. AMI has nearly 7,000 members with clinical, manufacturing, and regulatory expertise. Today, AMI is the healthcare industry's primary source for medical device standards. What are the standards that AMI has set for surgical gowns? Well, let's take a closer look. Amy has established a set of surgical gown standards that all manufacturers must meet. These standards have been adopted by the FDA as the standards that manufacturers must follow. These standards outline the testing requirements for the four different levels of Amy barrier protection. 
As an end user, how can you tell if the gowns you're use, currently using comply with any of these levels of protection? Next slide, please. First, don't rely on language that may use vague terms such as impervious or impermeable. These words are easily misinterpreted and could be misleading. Such language lacks specificity regarding performance and test methods. Instead, rely on Amy level stated on the gown label. That's your best assurance of barrier protection that the gown provides. Next slide, please. How are the barrier protection levels defined? First of all, they're based on potential exposure to blood, body fluids, and other potentially infectious materials. The classification of the barrier protection levels are from one to four and are based on what we call the hierarchy of risks. That hierarchy is determined by the type and volume of fluids and the duration of exposure. Let's take a look, closer look at our four Amy levels. As previously mentioned, there are four levels, with one being the least protective and four being the most protective. For example, you may use a level four gown for an open colectomy due to the length of the procedure and the fluid exposure. On the other hand, a laparoscopic procedure may only require a level three gown due to the small incision and limited fluid exposure. In labor and delivery, during a cesarean infection procedure, a level four barrier would be appropriate due to the anticipated amount of fluid exposure. However, during a postpartum tubal ligation procedure, a level three barrier would be appropriate because of the amount of fluid exposure anticipated. Next slide, please. Let's stick, dig a little deeper into the details. This slide shows what level one is used for recommended use for it is for situations when there's minimal risk of exposure such as during a simple excisional biopsy level two is for low risk procedures such as tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy on levels three and four on the next slide level three is for moderate risk situations such as mastectomies arthros arthroscopic orthopedic procedures, open gastrointestinal and G GU procedures. And level four is for the highest risk procedures, including any time the surgeon's hands and arms are in the patient's body cavity. Examples include open cardiovascular procedures, thoracic procedures, trauma procedures, and as I mentioned before, cesarean section. How does Amy test gowns to determine their level of barrier protection? Amy uses a range of factors to just establish barrier effectiveness, such as the gown materials, resistance to water and blood penetration. Four different areas of the gown must pass the barrier effectiveness guidelines. The illustration shows the four areas within the critical zone. These include two zones on the front and two on the sleeve. The sleeve includes the sleeve seam. Next slide, please. How do you choose the right gown for each procedure to ensure that you have the appropriate level of barrier protection? A good place to start is to ask yourself these three questions. How much fluid do you expect to be present during the procedure? How long will this procedure last? And what is my role in the procedure? Remember, the ultimate decision on which barrier level to wear is determined by the clinician's judgment, which is usually a result of the procedure knowledge and past experience. I have a personal example. In the past, I worked with a general surgeon whose laparoscopic cholecystectomies would often convert to long, fluid-intense, open cholecystectomies. Ordinarily, if I was scrub scrubbing a straightforward lap chole, I would choose a level three barrier. But for this surgeon, I would wear a level four barrier, a decision that I made based on my knowledge and past experience with this surgeon. Next slide, please. 
From there, it's important for clinicians and materials management staff to collaborate closely to match the right gown with the right procedure. You should weigh such factors as the risk of surgical site infection and using the right level of protection for each procedure so you're not paying for more protection than you need. It's also important to understand each clinician's personal preference and comfort level. As you weigh these factors, you'll be able to make more informed decisions about which Amy levels to stock at each facility. To control costs even further, you can streamline your product and vendor selections to maximize both safety and cost effectiveness. Next slide, please. Thank you again for your time and attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Ayla, if you want to yes, take yes. the floor to answer questions, that would be fantastic. Yes. And thank you, Sandy, for that fantastic presentation. And we do want to now begin today's question and answer session. And as a reminder, please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a, enter a question for staff and clicking send. We will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. We've already had several questions come in, so we'll go ahead and get started with them. And the first one is, I was looking at my surgical gowns ahead of this webinar and noticed not all of the packages have the Amy level marked on the package. Do all surgical gowns have an Amy rating? Thank you, Ayla, that's an excellent question. No, not all gowns in the market today have an Amy level rating as part of the package labeling. I can say Cardinal Health, that at Cardinal Health, all of our surgical gowns have an Amy rating clearly noted on our package, but there are some gowns that are not rated. Great, thank you Sandy for that clarification. And moving on to the next question, it is, are the Amy level recommendation by procedure you gave an absolute or, or are there situations where I might use a different Amy level for some of those procedures listed? Another good question and as I stated in the information, there, the guidelines are, excuse me, the levels are to be used as a guideline. It's the clinician that ultimately needs to decide what level protection is right for you based on your experience and judgment. That's why you should ask yourself those three questions that we discussed that will help guide you along with your judgment and past experience to choose the appropriate gown. Thank you. And moving on to the next question, it is, you mentioned that gowns are tested for a range of factors, including water and blood penetration. Are surgical gowns tested for blood-borne pathogens specifically? Thank you, Amy, or Ayla, excuse me. Um, the test is called F1671, and it's called the resistance of materials used in protective clothing to penetration by blood-borne pathogens. It's a long name, but you will hear most people refer to it as F1671 when they're talking about the AMI standards. This particular test is used for the level four testing, and if a gown passes this test in those critical areas, the surgical gown can be labeled as an AMI level four surgical gown. This test is only used on AMI level four gowns. The other AMI levels use a range of tested, tests focusing on liquid penetration resistance. Great, thank you so much, that's so helpful to understand. And moving on to uh, one last question here. Um, it is in a couple of places throughout the presentation, I noticed that each Amy level had a different color associated with it. Is that the same for all surgical gown vendors? Uh, another good question, Ayla. Amy did not define the color coding by Amy level, so it can be different across vendors. At Cardinal Health, we use blue for Amy level three and purple for Amy level four. Vendors will use other colors to distinguish themselves from each other. Great, thank you so much. And I want to take time to once again thank Sandy for her excellent pre presentation and to our audience for participating today. Uh, we now have to wrap up the webinar, but please enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to having you join us 
for future webinars.